We'll begin with Peter Sellers, uh, who will open a conversation, or rather reopen the conversation he's undertaken for some time with Toni Morrison and Rokia Traore. After about 15 or 20 minutes, we'll proceed to the faculty respondents. They'll each end their remarks with a question for the artists, and we'll give the artists a chance to respond. At around 1.30, no later, I promise to cut them off, um, we'll then take audience questions, so you'll have to stick around at least that long to hear your own voices. But you'll want to stick around longer, for after a short break at 2 p.m., at which time we'll somewhat grudgingly say goodbye to Toni Morrison, Peter and Rokia will then engage in a discussion of the collaboration, and Rokia will offer a tantalizing sample of her music. After that, the audience will once again be invited to ask questions, and we'll conclude at three. I hope you enjoy yourselves. I know I will. Oh, you need the microphone? <laughs> This microphone goes from Celeste. Thank you so much, Celeste. Directly to Rokia Traore. Good morning, everyone. And do we have Toni Morrison uh, happening? Toni Morrison, good morning. Well, hello. <laughs> Hello, Tony. I'm <laughs> nice. happening. I'm happening. You are very happening. You are gigantic. I'm very impressed. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see you, Peter. And Rookie. <laughs> uh, Tony, welcome to California. Thank you. We've been having very exciting performances these two last two nights here. And, um, and maybe uh, you saw the performance just a week ago in, in uh, Paris. Um, would you just say a word about your words on the stage now and together with this music of Rokia? Oh, this is an extraordinary thing. Um, obviously, in France, everything was in French on the screen. And of course, the cast uh, was talking in English. So I was doing both, running my eyes to the left and saying, uh-huh and then listening at the same time. What was extraordinary for me, I hope this doesn't sound a little too self-aggrandizing, <laughs> but to read it was really, really compelling to me, just reading it. And at the same time, hearing the subtlety and the nuances and the power of the voice was an entirely different but supplemental experience. I think, Peter, you, you know, I know you do extraordinary things in the theater, but this combination of listening and reading at the same time while you're looking at visuals that are not overwhelmingly theatrical, you know what I mean, like no big explosions and things dropping out of the sky, when you t t <laughs> this for me was a truly, you know, almost in the classical Greek sense, you know, a theatrical experience. Would you say a word about uh, Rokia's music and your words? Well, you know, it's interesting because I was complaining in Paris to a journalist who was doing an interview, and I said, well, there are two or three songs that Rokia sings in English. And I know these songs. The rest of it she sings in Barbara. And it's been translated into French. And I can sort of get it. I said, but fundamentally, I don't know what she's saying. <laughs> but I am overwhelmed with her music. And I was trying to think, why is it that in spite of the fact that I have no translation of the lyrics of many of the songs she sings, why am I so moved? And so in love with her voice and her instruments. And I think it was at dinner that it occurred to me that the journalist had said, well, if you don't know what she's saying, if you don't know what the lyrics are, you know, can't you just ask? And I thought about that. And I think I said to you, Peter, it's like asking a cello, what are you saying? 
You know, the music is so beautiful. The instruments are so, I don't know, deeply, deeply moving that the lyrics are almost secondary, which is not to say I don't want to know because those transcriptions are going to be extremely important to me. But that's what I felt. This was an entirely, for me, brand new experience of music. Rokia, would you like to say a word about working with Tony across this year? <laughs> so, well, well, well um, uh, hi everybody. Uh, I will just uh, ask you, Peter, to be my translator today. Absolutely. Because you know my problem with English is that I never had opportunity to live in a country where people speak English. And I learned English at school. I'm supposed to be an English uh. teacher, but I write better than I taught to speak. So I panic totally when I'm in front of people who are waiting for me to give them information about my country, my continent. So I don't want to mistake. So to make sure everything will be clear, please, Peter, translate it. C'est mon plaisir. Alors, c'était un travail extraordinaire parce que de commencer à travailler à partir de ce que Tony voulait. On a eu une première rencontre avant qu'elle commence à écrire. Elle so the, the, it was an extraordinary process because it was about working along the lines that Tony really wanted and that was what was very important was the first meeting. Et elle, elle s'exprime, elle exprime ce qu'elle pense, ce qu'elle imagine d'une manière extraordinaire. She expresses what she's thinking and what she's imagining in an extraordinary manner. Donc j'ai compris le texte à, te, à un tel point que lorsque elle, elle m'a envoyé ses premiers brouillons, c'est comme si j'étais déjà au courant. So when she, f when Ro when Rokia first received the first batch of text, she felt like she was already deep in the project and already flowing with it. C'était, je pense que les chansons pour elle, effectivement, elle n'avait pas besoin de traduction. I think maybe she doesn't actually need translations of my songs. Parce que tout ce qui a été fait, même si c'est en bambara, je l'ai fait par rapport à son monde que j'ai intégré, auquel j'ai adhéré, et qui m'a plu. Parce que c'est ça aussi, il faut aimer le travail de quelqu'un pour pouvoir collaborer. So Rokia's songs are responding to a world that Tony opened and presented, which pleased Rokia and gave her a wish to be part of that world, a wish to enter that world and engage with that world. C'est un travail très agréable, très instructif pour moi. Et euh, je dis d'ailleurs, je parle au passé, je veux dire la création du travail. Et depuis qu'on a commencé à exécuter ce travail sur scène, je ne cesse d'apprendre encore de toi, Peter, de l'actrice avec moi, de moi-même, tout ce que je peux faire que je ne savais pas que je pouvais faire, et des défauts, des qualités que j'ai envie d'améliorer. Donc c'est simplement une expérience extraordinaire. Uh, Rocky is unbelievable. So she's saying that the process of working on this was deep learning because Rokia's normal work is more in music and in concerts. And so working with an actress on stage, working with a text by Toni Morrison, rehearsing in a very different way, you rehearse for theater, created uh, uh, an experience of a learning. And as Rokia said, so it was interesting for me to work on my strengths, but also what she says, her faults. Um, in this context, uh, which, which opened up a new space. I would like to ask each of you ladies, what happened this year that you worked on this project? Because this was a very big year in each of your lives. Would you maybe say a word about this year? Uh, Rokia, would you, because you moved back to Bamako and you've created for this a very powerful expression that really comes from there. C'est un projet qui correspond à une, une période de changement dans ma vie. This project is connected to a period of change in my life. On arrive à un niveau, euh, la musique pour moi était un rêve. Je ne savais pas qu'un jour j'allais pouvoir faire de la musique. Je, je n'aurais pas cru dans le meilleur de mes rêves. Et c'est arrivé. Et puis, euh, so this music, the music to ce, ce, ce music. Ma, mon travail comme musique. Yes, that, that her, travail, uh, her work as a, a musician 
already is a dream, is something that she could not have imagined, a dream that she would actually be able to live in. Et de, de pouvoir devenir musicienne professionnelle, tourner pendant dix ans, je l'ai fait. To become a professional musician, to tour for ten years. Et c'est fatigant, mais It's je, tiring. On est content. But you're really happy. Chaque fois qu'on est sur scène, qu'on a un public en face de soi, euh, j'ai un, un trac de quelques minutes au début parce que je me dis mais c'est pas possible, je vais forcément faire une erreur parce que je ne suis pas une musicienne. Voilà. So when there's a public in front of her, uh, you know, she has this moment of stage fright. She's sure she's going to do something really terrible, but then something moves and it's fine. Et puis, au bout de dix ans, à un moment, les, les priorités changent. And after ten years, your priorities change. J'ai eu envie de, d'avoir plus, de retourner au Mali. I felt like I really wanted to go back to Mali. Et prendre le temps de m'imprégner euh, d'une autre manière de ma culture. Uh, to, to take another way of impregnating herself with her own culture. In a, in, a, in a deeper way. Parce que j'ai ces moyens désormais, professionnellement. Because she has the means professionally. Et de travailler avec tous ces jeunes par rapport au projet que j'ai au Mali, de fondation, est une manière pour moi de rentrer dans leur monde que je ne connais pas. Uh, Rokia has a foundation in Mali. The young women who you see performing here are part of this foundation, which is about supporting young artists in Mali. Rokia says, for me, this is a way of entering their world and of participating in a world of young people in Mali today. Que je ne connais pas. Which I don't myself Et understand. Que je n'ai pas vécu comme eux le vivent parce que j'ai pas entièrement grandi au Mali. I haven't lived there the way they've lived there these last years. So part of the return to Mali was working with these young people. Et puis arrive la réalisation de ce projet. And de then ce this project arrives. Et donc c'est une année spéciale. J'avais envie de travailler depuis le Mali, d'impliquer ces jeunes là. So I wanted to involve these young women with this project. Et uh, de vivre avec elles quelque chose qui est une expérience très importante pour moi-même déjà et que elle ne réalise peut-être pas mais à leur niveau il y a 10 ans, 12 ans, je je n'ai pas eu cette opportunité. And so she's working with these young women on this project which opens doors for them and creates new artistic possibilities for them that 10 years ago Rokia never had in her own life. Donc voilà, c'est un projet qui me dépasse et du coup ça me donne aussi envie d'y arriver, envie de faire en sorte que ça marche pas seulement pour moi, mais pour tous les participants. Euh, à la fois Tony, Peter, euh, les jeunes et euh, ça rend le projet encore plus symbolique. Ce n'est pas juste un travail musical ou théâtral qu'on exécute. Il y a toute une volonté, euh, une, des convictions et un objectif derrière. What makes the project larger than just a, a musical project or a theatrical project, it's symbolic. It, what's important for Rokia is the project is beyond her. It's not about her. It's about also Tony, it's about the actress, it's about these young women, it's about something that reaches beyond music, beyond theater, and becomes a symbol of a way of working and a way of living and being in this new period. Tony? Yes? Would you, would you just talk about this year and this project in your life? And Rokia in your life a bit this year also? Well, it's a little entangled, I think. I haven't made a great deal of structural sense. But the big things that happened to me are connected in some way to the project, and especially to Rokia's music. The major thing was my son died. And that is where you go back to square one. And everything you think you know, and all the insight you think you have, and what you tell other people about, it sort of floats and drifts away. But during that time, I got a CD, I guess, you know, of the music, too, in fact. And she, her music helped me weep. And I kept that freedom. It's a kind of a delicious morning. 
that's not self-destructive. And it, it has a tinge of sadness, but it's grander than that. And I remember sending her an email after I had listened to one of a, a disc of her music. And then the other thing that happened this year is that I stopped the paralysis, creative paralysis, that followed the death of my son and decided that I wanted him to be proud of me. So I finished the novel I was working on. I finished it in such a state of happiness and it'll be published in May, you'll be happy to know. But for me, it's not an event. It's just the kind of threads that move through life, one event, touching another event, touching another event, and somehow the year. We started this project, what, Peter, two years ago, two, yes. three years ago? Yes. But it became to fruition, really, this year after we got, you know, the cast and you were poking at me and digging at me and saying, what about this and what about that? And it, that took me to an entirely different place, which was both familiar and strange, which is for me the ideal situation in an art project. The familiarity, because I knew the play, I understood the language, but I had to develop my own language and to estrange something that was familiar, to make it strange, fresh, new, by relying on what was already there. That for me is uh, the supreme state of creativity and intelligence for me. Oh, Tony, could I? Could I ask you to, I mean, you, we decided, you felt already a couple of years ago, it was important that these women speak from the other side of the grave, that this was an open space that they could speak from. Would you say a bit about that decision? Well, once I was permitted, I guess by you, to get Iago out of the way, who just botches up everything and talks all the time and nobody tells him the truth or whatever. Then there was not there was the space for the people, for the rest of the cast. And the fact that they were all dead was even better because there was timelessness. It was infinite. There was nothing to lose. So when they encounter each other in that space, there's no reason to I mean they do confront and they argue, they blame, etc. But it never ends there. It never ends there. There's something beyond it. I was trying to tell somebody at dinner last night about um, the maid, Barbary, and oh, uh, Desdemona, the two actresses. And they say, yeah, but you're white, but I'm black, but you're the mistress, but I'm the servant. I mean, that's the tenor of their reintroduction. And it's blame, and you don't understand me, and I don't understand you. And then at some point, Desdemona says, but did I ever hurt you? And Rokia says, no. Well, that's it. It's just me and you. It's not about class anymore. It's not about race anymore. It's not about who's right and who's mistaken and who's judgment. That's what's possible in the so-called afterlife. Now that we have all the time, now that we have all the space, and it's just the two of us, this is what can happen with two individuals. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Rokia, would you just speak a little bit about uh, this singing from the other side of the grave and the way in which when you sing, uh, you're also using music that's ancestral, that has already a long history of voices. Ce qu'il y a, c'est que une fois qu'on est dans l'au-delà, effectivement, on peut tout dire. Euh, on n'a plus peur de rien. On ne meurt pas deux fois, et ça permet de parler de choses 
de nos jours que, euh, dont on parle difficilement. So already speaking from the grave means you're beyond a place of fear. You have the space to speak about things that are difficult to speak about in life. Dans cet endroit, il n'y a plus de rancœur, plus de. There's no more rancor. Plus de gêne, plus de scrupule. Ce n'est plus. Ce sont des sentiments qui n'ont plus you're, de sens. You're, you're not irritated, and at the same time, your scruples have a different place. Et comme le dit, l'a dit d'ailleurs Tony, ça permet de parler de ces choses-là entre, pour moi, africaines et de choses entre l'Afrique et l'Occident. This, as Tony was just saying, this piece allows me to speak about Africa, but also about Africa and the West and the relation. Cette relation très compliquée. This complicated relationship. Qui a commencé d'une manière extrêmement vile. Which started in an extremely vile, evil manner. Et dont on a du mal encore à se décharger. Donc And so we still have a lot of evil that we need to get rid of. D'un côté, il y a un sentiment de culpabilité. So there's already the feelings of guilt. Et de l'autre côté, on est perdu. And from the other side, the feelings that we're lost. C'est-à-dire que parlons de ce qui est le plus récent, la colonisation. If we just take the chapter that's most recent, colonialization, sera duré plus d'un siècle. It lasted more than a century. Et pendant tout ce temps, à expliquer à des gens, des êtres humains qui avaient une manière de vivre, des cultures, que tout ce qu'ils faisaient avant ne valait pas le coup, qu'il fallait changer les manières de faire. So it was across this time that an entire uh, body of people were told that their culture, everything about the way they chose to live, had no value and had to be eliminated. À cette époque-là, des personnes très intelligentes d'Occident sont parties dans ces pays. Uh, at this time, some very, very intelligent people from the West came to Africa. Mais je pense qu'il manquait d'humilité, pardon. But, I, of course, Rokia says, but I think they may have lacked humility. Excuse me for saying so. <laughs> c'est que, c'est très sincère, et ce, cette pièce permet, j'en parle plus facilement, euh, c'est tout ce que je pense dans la pièce qui passe plus facilement que d'en parler là. C'est extrêmement compliqué parce que ça peut passer. J'en je parle très librement. Je suis d'une génération qui a plus une position d'analyse que de rancune parce qu'on fait partie des deux désormais. So I'm already in a generation that speak, can speak about this more easily because you know my generation is a position to be able to analyze this, not just in the position to be confronted with it. Mais ça reste compliqué parce que quand on a un minimum de dignité, on a l'impression de se plaindre tout le temps. So uh, it's still complicated because when your dignity has been removed from you, you have the impression that you're just complaining all the time or, plea, or you're making a, a plea for things. Le problème est que le problème existe et qu'il est encore là, c'est que nous avons gardé un, un complexe d'infériorité. And so what the problem that remains and that was really installed was that we still have a deep inferiority complex. Parce que il est très difficile de savoir. On a gardé des bribes de choses de ce que l'Afrique était, de ce que la culture était. We have était. we have kept a few things of what Africa was. Et à la, la plupart des concepts auxquels on s'accroche. But the most of the ideas that we're really holding on to sont très fragmentés d'une part. Are so fragmented. Autre. Une histoire africaine euh, homogène n'existe pas. So a homogenous African story simply doesn't exist. Parce que il y a eu ces frontières. There have been all of these uh, borders that have been drawn. Liées aux pays euh, colonisateurs Connected différents. Connected to European colonizing countries. Et tout cela est à la source de tous les problèmes qu'il y a aujourd'hui encore en Afrique. And so all of these have created are, are still the source of problems that were created a century ago. Those problems remain with us today. Comment être ce qu'on attend, ce que les autres attendent qu'on soit, 
si on ne sait pas qui on est et qu'on n'a que envie de devenir ce que les autres voudraient qu'on soit. How can you become who you want to be if you don't know who you are? And how can you live with the expectations of these other people that they have for you and what they're projecting onto you? Et ce sont autant de questions que consciemment ou inconsciemment on se pose et beaucoup de jeunes se posent dans ces, ces pays, les pays d'Afrique. And so, so many young people today are consciously or unconsciously caught in the middle of those questions. Comment correspondre à l'attente des pays développés? So whether it's this attempt of the developed countries. Comment être à la mode? How to be hip in fashion, doing what supposedly we're all supposed to be doing. Et comment être digne? And yet have your own dignity. D'être accepté en tant que personne jeune civilisée d'une civilisation euh, de, de, par une civilisation de, de pays développés. And how to be accepted as a young person in a developed, civilized country. D'être sur scène avec tous ces jeunes, c'est pour to ça. To be on stage with all these young people. Je parlais de symbole. I'm speaking of the symbol. Pour moi, c'est cela le symbole, la simple présence. The symbol of presence de tous ces, toutes ces personnes qui ont toujours vécu en Afrique et qui vivent encore et qui, à travers la Fondation et le travail qu'on fait avec eux, n'ont aucune envie de rester en Occident. All of these young people who have grown up in Africa their entire lives and now because of the work of the foundation they have this other opportunity here they are but they also don't want to live in the west they really want to live in Africa. Et à travers la fondation c'est ce qu'on fait c'est qu'on se parle et on, on discute beaucoup. In her foundation they are speaking and discussing this a lot. Et pour moi ce, ce projet c'est une manière de leur dire aussi ben vous voyez ce que je vous ai dit je ne vous ai pas menti vous êtes capable de le faire. La polyphonie n'est pas malien. C'est on est une culture de voix lead. Donc pour elle au début tenir deux notes en même temps c'était une difficulté incroyable et plusieurs fois elles m'ont dit on n'y arrivera jamais. So these young people many times thought they wouldn't make it. They wouldn't be able to work to Rokia's very exacting standards. In Rokia's music, it, for this performance, she's introduced polyphony, which doesn't exist in the ears of Malians. You know, it's from more to the south in Africa. And so the power of this performance is also that they can feel they've succeeded at something they didn't think they could succeed at. And this idea of holding a high standard, setting a task, and then reaching it across time, that's one of the most important symbolic parts donc, of this performance. Uh, tout ce qu'on exprime là, la, le texte de Tony, l'ensemble de la pièce, est une manière d'exprimer des choses qui ne sont pas faciles à dire avec les mots, uh, dans des relations, de minorité en général. Là, je parle d'Afrique. Il y a la, 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 la position de la femme. So these are, uh, and Tony's text then in Africa speaks of things that are very difficult to discuss in Africa, in particular the position of women. Et donc euh, d'être là, pareil, au-delà du texte, la simple présence est une preuve que aujourd'hui la situation est différente. So already these young women on the stage with Tony's text creates a symbol of a different situation and a possibility of another era. Et faire des choix en Afrique pour une femme aujourd'hui, c'est possible, même si... That, and, and the symbol and the sign of the performance for these young women to be on stage with Tony's text is that it is now possible for women in Africa to make a different choice. Même si il reste des zones selon les ethnies et les régions où il y a encore un travail à faire. Even if there are in parts of Africa because of ethnic groups or certain regions, places where there's still much work to do on behalf of women. Comme dans le reste du monde. As in the rest of the world. <laughs> Tony, would you just comment on that on the, from the American side? Well, it's hardly much more to say, uh, but that last observation about the rest of the world uh, stuck home with me. I gave a speech recently in Geneva, uh, and they asked me to speak on human rights and women's rights. So I thought I would take that topic as my topic. And I said, 
you know, one of these days we could say human rights and women's rights won't be a supplement, a sort of afterthought. The human rights and over here the women's rights. It will all be assumed to be one thing. And then tried to concentrate on the varieties of control. Some violent and abusive, some gentle, some just misleading. But the absolute requirement of sovereign nations to control, exploit uh, women. Uh, from the smallest things to the lashing of women who have cell phones. Uh, to what is this recent thing in the United States, that in some state where the egg, the fertilized egg, is now a person. Not the mother of the fertilized egg, but just the egg itself. So this constant, I don't know, roiling of reproduction uh, is part of a larger concerted effort not to lose the supreme place that men have held. It does not mean a matriarch as opposed to a patriarch. It just means that all the archies can go, that people can be valued in terms of what they, who they are uh, as complicated human beings and what they do that is positive in the world. So that speaking of what Rokia hopes to do with her foundation, is extremely exciting project to me and coming out of what we're doing here you know in the play and, and those gorgeous women on stage behind her <laughs> uh, you like them tony i know that i know i love them i want more <laughs> they should do more stuff <laughs> <laughs> so, but all of that moves in the right direction toward, you know, piece by piece, bit by bit. And then we will have equality. And when people say human rights, there's not a footnote. Oh, by the way, and also women. <laughs> Well, I think, Celeste, we should probably open up and invite some of the, the Berkeley participants. Am I right, Celeste? No, you're not. Great. Great, great. Here is Celeste from the Townsend Center, Tony. I don't know where I am. I'm oh, over here, okay. So um, if the panelists will come up, I'll introduce you as you walk up, just as if you were receiving an Oscar. Um, uh, Abdul John Muhammad uh, is a professor of English and author of several books, both on African literature he wrote a book called Manichaean Aesthetics, The Politics of Literature in Colonial Africa, and African American Literature. Most recently, a book called The Death-Bound Subject, Richard Wright's Archaeology of Death. He's currently writing a book called Thick Love, whose title derives from Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved. And he'll address the concept of thick love in his remarks today. Tamara Roberts, assistant professor of, uh, in the music department, is a scholar, teacher, and artist devoted to exploring the aesthetic, political, and spiritual potential of imaginative performance. Her current research investigates the connection between sound and race, centering on forgotten interracial and intercultural histories of popular music in the US. Her remarks today will concern what she calls hidden interculturalisms. Tamara also works as a composer, sound designer, and performer in music, theater, dance, and film. Derek Scott, associate professor in African American studies, is the author of a book titled Extravagant Abjection, Blackness, Power, and Sexuality in the African American literary imagination, which examines representations and theorizations of the relation between blackness and objection, and especially queer masculinity. Scott is also the author, author of two novels, Hex and Traitor to the Race, 
and the editor of Best Black Gay Erotica. He'll address his attention today, probably, to a powerful scene in Desdemona. His title is Passing Strange Intimacies. All right, we'll begin with, uh, and each of the panelists will end with a question for our artist. Um, Abdul. Um, thank you, Celeste, uh, for the introduction, but particularly for inviting me to this event. It's been fantastic, and I would like to thank uh, uh, Tony Morrison, Peter, and Roy Kay for um, Expert on sound. Okay. Um, I, I would like to thank the three of you for putting together this absolutely fantastic performance. Um, I've seen it twice already, and I'm going to try and get a ticket for the third one tonight. Uh, um, I do have a question, uh, particularly for Toni Morrison, and it's a question about death. Um, but I would, before I jump into that question, I would like to perhaps give a little background mainly for the benefit of the audience that may not be that familiar with Morrison's work, uh, because I think Toni Morrison's work has an absolutely unique take on the question of death, and on particular the question of the way in which life and love on the one hand and death on the other hand interact and, 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 and mingle. Um, and that particular mode is the mode that I would call thick love. And thick love, as I will uh, outline in a minute, is a phrase that comes out of Beloved. Um, and it's a very specific mode of, of combining life and death. And looking at Othello, the performances uh, last two nights, it becomes very clear to me, in hindsight, that Othello is about thick love as well. It's about how love and death mix. And of course, the performance Desdemona is then a commentary on thick love once again. Um, let me, if I may, just unpack the question of, of thick love and I think more importantly uh, the question of death as it haunts and stalks African American culture and African American literature. And this comes out of the fundamental fact that slavery is not possible, you cannot enslave somebody unless you threaten to kill them. And that threat of death has to be followed up with X number of lynchings, of killings, so that people understand that you are serious. And that threat of death has to be held in front of the slave every day of his or her life. Otherwise, the slave will say, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. We'll stop cooperating. So cooperation uh, uh, of the slave, uh, but also under Jim Crow society uh, in, 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 in the US South, uh, in the early part of this, at the turn of the century, in the early part of the century, uh, there were an average of two people lynched every week in the Deep South. And if you can imagine what the effect of that would be if you were part of that population in which any individual could be plucked out at any point and lynched or killed in other ways without any consequences to the lynchers. That is the, te that is the first name of terrorism in America. Uh, and I think that's, that's something we, may, may, we must remember. But the important point for, for, for this particular performance is that this mode of coercion, the threat of death, is not something external to the individual. It eventually permeates the very structure of individuality. Um, Tony Morrison's uh, a Beloved has this wonderful phrase that freedom at one point is defined as not having the need to ask permission for desire, right? If you think about that for a moment, what is being implied is that if you want to love your child, instead of letting that child be taken away and sold on the auction block, if your desire is to be a mother, you have to get permission. And what, what that implies is that everything you want to do in your life, all forms of uh, uh, willpower, desire, affection, love, all need to have permission. And when that happens, you cannot say death is something that's outside. It permeates the self, uh, partly because you have to come to terms every day with whether or not you're going to indulge in a particular action because you're afraid to die or not to die. It's your choice to die or not to die. That's on the line on a daily basis, minute by minute, in some fundamental way. Um, and I think that that fact has 
permeated uh, deeply into African American culture and is represented in the most fantastic way in African American literature. From the earliest slave narratives, uh, Douglas and Jacobs, to the present, uh, the novels of Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, Gail Jones, and of course to the very play we just have been seeing and you guys are performing. It's full of death in some way. Um, It's interesting to me also that, that um, there's an argument out there, a book by Adam Gusov, who says that the blues as a musical tradition, and as an intellectual tradition as well, came out as a response to lynching. That the fact of death and the presence of lynching is, is so destructive to the self uh, and makes you feel so powerless that one way to cope with that is to sing the blues. And so the blues then becomes an expression of misery. It becomes a way of understanding what that misery is all about. But most importantly, it becomes a way of overcoming the misery by turning pain into pleasure, into something beautiful. Right? Um, and if you're going to talk about blues as an articulation of misery, Desdemona, as you pointed out, of course, is, does mean misery, as the play very much says. So, so I think this, this uh, 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 play is very much out of the blues tradition in a, in a very deep kind of way. And what I would like to remark upon here is the fascination that I have that there's a double circuit set up here as I see it. One is the blues tradition, which is to say to the, some extent the blues tradition grows out of an adaptation of African music music that came over with this place. It gets transformed and turned into the blues, which then goes back to Africa and has an effect on African music as well. And here we have in Desdemona, African music coming back to the US and, 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 and influencing US music as well. And, and there's a parallel circuit, I think, about death as well, uh, which is to say that if you look carefully at Toni Morrison's work and, and other African-Americanist writers, uh, you will see that there is a very different conception of death, an African conception of death, that is present in that. Um, and that, again, then I find fascinating that it's gone back to, to Reika's music and, and, and has come back to the United States in a very complicated kind of way. Um, okay. If not, all right. Don't forget your moving to Yeah. Um, so I could expand further on the notion of thick love. Uh, I think perhaps not necessary because most of you are familiar with uh, the novel, Beloved, where this comes. But just to make it clear, what I want to say is that uh, uh, there's this dialogue between Paul D. and Margaret and, 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 and Seth, um, was the version of Margaret Garner. And Seth, as you know, has killed her child and committed infanticide rather than allow that child to be taken back into slavery. Uh, and so there's a question of which kind of death is preferable, the actual death or the death of slavery itself. Um, and Paul D. says to uh, uh, Seth, your love is too thick. That this is a kind of love that killing a child out of love is something that's not comprehensible. It's a kind of love that's too thick. And what I would like to propose is that uh, thick love has been worked up in one way or another in Toni Morrison's work from the earliest novel to the present uh, 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 play, The Desdemona. And um, it, it, what fascinates me is the different forms that thick love takes in, in, in Toni Morrison's novel. Um, and so I, I guess I would like to end with three questions, <laughs> if possible. Um, <laughs> First is, is that it seems to me that Desdemona, and actually this is something you touched on already, Peter. Desdemona, I think, in, in Toni Morrison's corpus, is the only text that's, in, that's presented entirely from the other side of life, from the side of death. Every other text, there's complicated mixture. And so the question I have is, for Toni Morrison, is how does, is, if you could comment on how different you see Desdemona being in the entanglement with life. And, and, you know, for me, there are many, many different forms of thick love in your work, and I'm wondering, you know, how different this is as, as another form of thick love. Um, 
The second question is, I'm not sure I should be asking this, but uh, I, I will in any way. I think this experience of death is not a conceptual issue at all. It's an experiential issue. And I think Toni Morrison's take on death is unique in the whole structure of the realm of African American uh, literature. Death normally is accompanied by enormous amounts of fear, anger, violence, hostility. It is no writer like Richard Wright that I wrote on is on intimate terms with death. Death is something to be avoided at all points. Toni Morrison's work is entirely the opposite. I think, of course, she does not avoid the question of violence and bloodiness and nastiness and so forth. But there is a kind of serenity in the presentation of death. You could almost say that, that Toni Morrison's work is on very friendly terms with death. That death is not something that destroys life. It becomes a point from which you can rethink life, as in Desdemona very clearly. Um, and so I guess my question would be for Toni Morrison, where, where does this experience come from? What, what allows you to think about death in such a very different kind of way? And the third question I would have is uh, about a persistent rumor uh, that I think Peter touched on last, yesterday as well briefly, a uh, rumor that, Toni Morrison, that you have a, a manuscript somewhere uh, about the Emma Till case, that you're turning that into a novel or a play or I, I don't, that, that's been a persistent rumor. And, and I'm very, very curious about that because it, it seems to me that a case could be made that the civil rights movement began uh, not with the Rosa Parks issue, but with Emmett Till's mother's decision to show the face of death on the national stage, that she did not hide from her son's death, and she insisted that death be shown for what it is. And I think that had a dramatic repercussion, in, in, not only in African American culture, but elsewhere too. So those are the three questions. Thank you very much. Tom? Yes, thank you. How is this? Or should this we just go to Tony oh. and then come back? So Tony Maybe, has a chance. Yeah, Wouldn't yeah. that be nice? OK, that's a, would you like a chance to respond, Tony? <laughs> oh, I have such a short memory. <laughs> I, I'm actually supposed to repeat the questions. So one Let's question start with was, the third yours. one. That's the one I remember. Emmett Till. I wrote a play called Dreaming Emmett. And I felt two things at that time. One was that I never saw a play, a rare play, in which a young black teenager was taken seriously. Also, I was persuaded that um, Emmett Till was the beginning. But because of the sexual innuendo and the white girl and the, and the winking and so on, it wasn't the proper you know, vehicle. But a nice lady, I mean, they mythologized her also uh, on a bus trying to move, that was a little safer, a little better icon, you know, to begin to s collectively ask for jobs, end of segregation, et cetera. Uh, that play was really very interesting. Uh, <laughs> but I had worked very closely with Gilbert Moses, who was directing it, and uh, afterwards, uh, I thought, well, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this with just the script and none of the directions and the changes and the activity that you know he had put in, which is a profoundly stupid idea, you know, because the play was the collaboration between the two of us, and so I put it aside, and it's still aside, and it still lurks out there. And I feel a little bit stronger now, having done some theatrical things about that play, about actually letting somebody see it and maybe you know revising it, et cetera. But that was the, uh, you know, what I was doing at that time when I was at SUNY Albany in the Schweitzer chair. Uh, the second question was about familiarity with death. I mm -hmm. think. Well. Well, I have died a couple of times. I'll tell you about it one day. <laughs> Not now. But the other thing is, uh, 
part of it is, you know, a certain kind of religious upbringing and so on. But I remember being very impressed when I was talking to a woman, a black woman poet, who is very famous, very well known. And she was telling me that she was getting in touch with her mother uh, on a Ouija board. Her mother was dead. And I sort of smiled, you know, ha ha, thinking about being a kid, my sister and I playing with the Ouija board. And, but then I asked her, I said, what did your mother say? And she said, well, it was clear that her mother had no sense of time. I mean, chronology. She talked about things that had already happened as though they were going to happen. And she talked about things that nobody knew anything about as though they were the past, so that her sense of time was not man-made or, you know, the chronology that human beings have invented. And then I said, uh, she said she had the sense that her mother wasn't very interested in her in the conversation of the Ouija board. And I said, really? She said, no. At one point, I was asking her, what about this or what about that? And the mother said, would you excuse me? I have somewhere to go. I have something to do. And I thought, she has something to do. <laughs> but all of a sudden, afterlife became what my own ex personal experience of it was. It was active. Mm -hmm. It was curious. It was busy. It was sort of a refined uh, life <laughs> without the weight of the body and the weight of the this. It was pure intellect pure creativity, and sight, and speed. That was my take when she said, I have, I have something to do. I can't sit here and talk to you. <laughs> so it just altered my whole feeling about death. And then when I was presented with this project, and I said, I asked Peter, how long does this play last? I don't mean the performance, but the actual time from the opening scene to the end. He said, two days. And I said, what? That got married, that I killed her in two days, went to war. So that's too narrow a period of time. But since everybody was dead, except, you know, Iago in prison and Cassio and so on, the principles were dead, good. Now we have forever. Now we have what I said earlier, which was timelessness. So my attitude. I don't even think it's an attitude. My exploration of the so-called afterlife is, it's not heaven, it's not religious in that sense. It's like the mind goes on, you can call it spirit if you want, but it's a different kind of thing. So it's not, as Setha isn't afraid of it at all. She thinks she's taking her children. She wanted to kill them all, to a different place with her ancestors, back home, not in this place. She's taking them to a better place. And the other thing about willingness and fear of death, it's highly genderized, I think, during slavery times, because it's hard to get a mother to be willing to die if she had children to protect. The men, maybe yes, maybe no. But that was a, a fear which had to do with parenting right. and being maternal, I think, that, it, that, uh, that uh, constrained them or affected them in terms of how much force. You can't keep a slave population enslaved for two centuries without force. Somebody has to beat them and threaten them. So, but their response to it was what was really artistically and, and in terms of just spirit, extremely complicated and intelligent for me. So I forgot your first question. Okay. Shall first we, question? Can you can move on. Yeah, let's move on. Tony, we're gonna press on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. 
Uh, I just want to say thank you to Celeste for asking me to be on this panel and to the three artists for their masterful work that we're all getting to share in experiencing and also talking about today. Desdemona emerges from a desire to give voice. We hear characters marginalized in Shakespeare's Othello, such as Desdemona or Emilia, and ones like Barbary that are only mentioned. In Desdemona, Barbary is an individual with her own ability to speak. No longer a generalized African, Barbary becomes Saren and is present in the flesh to sing her own version of the Willow Song. Also, as Mr. Sellers has said, Desdemona is part of a process of making the images and stories in Othello relevant to today. Thus, Shakespeare's text is also given new voice thanks to this contemporary anti-racist and feminist companion piece. Watching the show, I initially found myself equating voice with dialogue. Desdemona recounts conversations she had with Othello while alive, and she and other characters encounter each other in the afterlife and discuss their twisted fates. And I heard Miss Trowe's songs as an ongoing conscious support to and commentary on Desdemona's monologue. Then, over halfway through the piece, Saren finally speaks and admonishes Desdemona, saying, we shared nothing. I found myself stunned in this moment, realizing that up until this point, Desdemona alone had narrated the spoken proceedings. The musical voice of Barbary is dramaturgically placed into dialogue with Desdemona, and beautifully so. But in the world of the afterlife, there is little interaction. We witness instead the happy theatrical convergence of Saren and Desdemona's mutual soliloquies. So what is dialogue? What does it take to actually share the space of conversation? What does true interchange look and sound like? If when we finally talk, if when they, fi when they finally talk, Saren can only clarify the false vision Desdemona held for their relationship, what comes next? Is there space in life to really have these difficult yet necessary discussions? Or will we only talk once it's too late? I want to briefly illuminate three elements of Desdemona that led me to this line of questioning. First, the role of mediation in the giving of voice, specifically the use of the microphone. Second, song versus text as a potential space of dialogue. And finally, the other cultural encounters that the show addresses, sometimes overshadowed in the colonial, post-colonial, and anti-colonial focus on racial difference. In a sense, the voicing of people and perspectives generally kept silent is inherently theatrical. When the status quo and the dominant narrative are considered the norm, the abnormal is imbued with a sense of vibrancy, the fantastical, or even the grotesque. Each of these emerges in Desdemona and is made grander through the purposeful amplification of voices. On a stripped down set consisting primarily of practicals, bare bulbs, mics, speakers, and cables, we are ushered into the world of the afterlife where characters wander and sort out their earthly deeds free from the stricture of time. Death provides new possibilities for cross-cultural encounter or possibly reconciliation. And this is mitigated by hearing voices in their fullest, loud, robust, well-EQ'd, and tempered with breath. At the same time, the microphones are a form of mediation. The performers speak and sing, but their voices are separated from their bodies. This is more pronounced in Desdemona's case, but across the board, there is an otherworldly sonic effect that gives them a not quite human character. This element is highlighted in moments when Desdemona sits at the stage left mic that covers her face. No longer able to see her facial gestures, we have only her amplified voice to rely on. The performer's interactions are also mediated through this technology. They sit right next to one another on the stage, but almost exclusively communicate through the disembodying apparatus, deferring the dialogue from their physical presences. The mics enable the characters to be heard, but perhaps not by each other. In fact, after Desdemona and Saren encounter one another face to face, the ensemble strips the stage of most of the listening system that's there, removing the, mon the monitor speakers and cable. Only when these technologies that we hide behind are eliminated can a real conversation begin. This message is further driven home by the Casio vo voiceover. Here is someone speaking from the other side, in this case, the side of the living. Not only does the limited frequency range of his voice reveal what Mr. Sellers called yesterday the mediocrity of what is left in Venice, but is also, it also highlights the one-sidedness of our earthly interactions. 
In life, we talk without the desire of a response. Thus, his representation by a static cue that interrupts Desdemona um, is, a, is an example of this feature. The afterlife provides the potential of greater back and forth, but as the show reveals, could still use some tweaking. Even in the end, the women sit in a circle finally looking at one another, but Desdemona still talks through a mic. Only Miss Traore's singing is sourced in a way to indicate a live voice singing from far upstage, even as it is enhanced with reverb. The women have broken new ground in dialogue, but exactly how it will unfold, we do not see in the space of performance. Clearly, uh, I was intrigued by the use of microphones and sound manipulation in this piece. So since I've said uh, a bit more on this topic, I'm just going to now briefly touch on the, my final two points. In his lecture yesterday, Mr. Sellers explained that the world he wanted to invoke on stage was a space of deep listening. He said this is meant to eliminate spectacle, and at the same time, I believe that it also highlights performance, in particular, the intermedia performance of music and text. The relationship between text and music in this piece is really quite astounding, particularly in the ways in which music is given space to tell the story in ways that differ from spoken text. For example, while Miss Traue's songs have narrative components, they are generally not linear text, but repeating cycles of image and metaphor. As words and melody circle back, sometimes after interjections from Desdemona, Barbary's statements take on new meaning and greater weight through their repetition. Through music, we are also able to, ca able to capture a glimpse of a different form of dialogue, in which voices speak concurrently while simultaneously listening to one another. The layers of lead vocals, chorus, and multiple instruments provide a model for ensemble, convergence, and intelligibility that spoken voices cannot. Finally, while I focus mainly here on cross-racial encounter, I think it's important to highlight the other worlds that collide in Desdemona. First, the worlds of men and women. As a companion to Othello, this piece really explores the very different worldviews and experiences of people falling into these two gender categories. In particular, Ms. Morrison draws out the distinctly masculine and feminine roles within warfare and the disproportionate violence perpetuated by the former on the latter in these confrontations. While at first Desdemona describes how she tried to be understanding of Othello's war exploits, she eventually exclaims that she always despised war and could not forgive him for the atrocities he rendered. In a similar vein, the starting point for this piece that to make an anti-racist piece means to start from a feminist perspective is important. Not only are patriarchy and imperialism housed within the same male figures in Othello, the two ideologies also operate hand in hand in shutting out the voices of women, people of color, and women of color. Resurrecting Barbary's voice and true name thus does work in both of these areas. The worlds of the living and the dead are also cultural spaces that are placed in, into contrast in this piece. And we've already heard uh, a, a bit of discussion about this today. But this piece argues that there is space in the afterlife for reflection that is just not possible while living, especially because of how time functions. In life, we race against the clock, and rash decisions such as murder and suicide seem almost inevitable. In death and eternity, time exists as space, unmarked and without pressure, for it will always remain. What has happened, is happening, and might happen in the future can be seen, weighed, and put into perspective. At the same time, as the exchange of the mothers about the altar shows, views of the afterworld are culturally specific, and for the living can mean the difference of seeing, seeing the relationship between the living and dead as one of interpenetration or one of antithesis. Perhaps most importantly, and this leads to, to my question for today, this production highlights the encounter between Africa, Africans, America, and African Americans. I was struck by Mr. Seller's comments yesterday on the current function of artists in society to provide an example of people willing to collaborate across difference and sometimes difficulty. And so, having talked about mediation, technology, difference, and dialogue, I'm curious to hear from Ms. Morrison and Ms. Traue, how do you both understand the relationship and potential for dialogue between Africans and African Americans? And how has the reworking of Othello provided this space? Um, related, I would also like to ask Ms. Morrison specifically, in what ways did working with Ms. Traue shift your visions of Africa from fantasy to reality? Oh, 
Well, um, in a number of ways, when Rokia talks about her music, and she said something that should have been obvious to me, you know, I think it was in Paris where she said, most people think of African music as drums, drums and dancing, and I thought, uh-huh. <laughs> So that the whole world of music being produced on that continent is just erased, at least with you know the most most of us. I don't mean that it's not appreciated and devoted fans have accumulated around it, but just that kind of opening for me. Um, I know it's a little obvious, but nevertheless, sometimes you just don't know stuff. <clears throat> And the other thing is finding a, I don't know, an intimacy, an intimacy that, you know, one talks about in literary terms and travelers talk about it all the time and you sort of know it's there. And I have heard the tales of my grandparents and so on, but to really feel that intimacy, not as an exotic place, not as a destination for Ancestry.com or whatever that is, but uh, an intimacy that is unique and at the same time familiar. I was trying to stress, this is what art does. It familiarizes the strange and estranges the familiar. All for the purpose of the play. For me, the whole thing is about the acquisition of knowledge. When they talk to one, from different parts of the social strata, different experiences, whatever. But they have the time now, or the timelessness now, to have that conversation move from the obvious. It doesn't, it's not necessarily even about reconciliation, which would be fine if it happens. But it's not just that. It's finally knowing more than you knew when you were alive or than you knew when you first died. Now you have this time. And now these people come to you, or her, or them. And now, over time, nothing to lose. You can do what art does, which is acquire knowledge, which is therefore useful and enhancing, as well as in life. Alors, si j'ai bien compris, il s'agit de, de dialogue qu'il qui peut y avoir entre Africains et Am, euh, Africains américains. Ou américains. If, if I understood correctly, it really is about the dialogue that can exist now between Africa and African Americans. Tout à fait. Et ensuite, euh, comment euh, transformer tous, tous ces fantasmes, effectivement. And how to transform à, all of these phantasms par rapport à l'Afrique en réalité. About Africa into some kind of reality. J'ai bien compris. I think I understood. <laughs> uh, il, il est compliqué, elle a compliqué la relation entre Africains et Amériques, Afro-Américains. It's a complicated relationship between Africans and African Americans. Parce, parce qu'il y a eu une rupture. Because there was a rupture. On a eu une histoire en commun. We had a common history. Euh, les stars afro-américains qui passent à la télé en the, Afrique the African -American stars who are on African television sont très appréciés. Are very appreciated. Le public a l'impression, il y a un lien, c'est-à-dire que c'est très naïf, mais pour eux, ils connaissent l'histoire, mais n'ont pas forcément, la plupart des gens n'ont pas forcément analysé et compris ce qui s'est passé et toute la douleur qu'il y a eu, qui a fait que les Afro-Américains ont eu leur, une vie, une existence qui est devenue autre et donc qui est leur propre existence et leur identité qui est aujourd'hui différente de celle des Africains qui sont restés là-bas. And this uh, African appreciation of African American stars on television is naive in a certain way because it's not really fully understanding that African Americans have had their own separate struggle, own separate series of histories that have arrived in a very, very different place. On a, pour ceux qui savent lire, et malheureusement, ce n'est pas très souvent le cas en Afrique. For those who do understand, and unfortunately, it's not that widespread in Africa. 
Euh, There are things that you can read to help you understand. Euh, à propos de, de toute l'histoire, ce qui s'est passé, la manière dont ça s'est passé. Et le reste, pour une grande partie de la population, pour l'Afrique en entier, je pense que, sans exagérer, la, la partie de la population qui est capable de lire et écrire ne doit pas dépasser les 40%. Et encore, je suis très optimiste. Parce que pour le cas du Mali, je pense qu'on est autour de 20%. Et dans la réalité, des, ça ce sont les statistiques, de la réalité et le niveau, je pense qu'on n'atteint pas cela. Donc, la plupart des gens n'ont que la télé qui est, est ce qu moyen de, 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 de les films qui passent et même pas les documentaires qui présentent les choses d'une manière très euh, euh, mise en scène et qui ne, ne permet pas forcément de comprendre la réalité, avoir un équilibre le plus, disons, juste. Uh, so, uh, Rocky is saying a very small portion of the African population is literate and has access to literature and histories that would provide context. And even in Mali, maybe only there's 20% of the population that could be described as literate, and maybe that's even an exaggeration uh, in higher than, it, than, than the reality. And so, for most Africans, seeing these uh, televised spectacles, which are very, very staged, there is not necessarily the understanding of the implications and the historical realities behind them. Et pour ce qui concerne le côté afro-américain, and for in terms of the side of Af afro-american side, malheureusement, je n'ai pas eu la chance de vivre assez longtemps ici pour comprendre ce qui se passe dans la tête des gens par rapport aux, à leurs origines. I really have not lived long enough in America to really understand what African Americans have in their heads about their origins and the connection. Quand j'ai joué ici la première fois, j'avais mon premier projet était basé sur des instruments traditionnels. My first project here in America when I first performed here in concert, I did a project based on traditional African instruments. C'était il y a 10 ans, je crois. It was 10 years ago. Et j'étais surprise de l'absence des Afro-Américains au spectacle. And I was amazed at the absence of African Americans in the audience. Lorsque j'ai posé la question à des Africains immigrés ici que je connais. And when I asked Africans who Afri African immigrants who I knew here. Ils m'ont raconté des choses qui m'ont rendu très triste. They told me things that made me very sad. Ils m'ont dit on, on a souvent. Euh, sans généraliser, mais ils m'ont dit on a des fois la remarque de certains Afro-Américains qui nous rend très tristes, qui tiennent responsables de leur esclavage nos origines. Donc le discours, c'est ce sont vos descendants qui ont vendu les nôtres. So what is underneath this was a longer idea from African Americans that their history of slavery was because Africans had sold their ancestors. Et euh, ils m'ont dit souvent, dans les endroits où on habite, ça, ça crée des problèmes qui peuvent être très violents. So that created a longer history that could become very violent with its own problems. Et du coup, je me suis rendu compte que peut-être qu'ici aussi, je dis bien peut-être, parce que je n'ai pas plus d'informations que ça. I'm saying maybe because I cannot, I don't have more information. Peut-être qu'il y a autant de... Hmm, de méconnaissance de la situation au niveau des Afro-Américains qu'il y en a au niveau des Africains. Malheureusement, on ne se connaît plus beaucoup. Il reste beaucoup de... Ça reste une relation très passionnelle avec beaucoup d'amour. On, on est si fiers, ça se voit dans le, les, les yeux des gens où ceux qui arrivent ici pour la première fois, les filles m'ont souvent dit elle, elle pourrait être ma sœur. Elle ressemble à ma cousine. Ils, mais ils sont là depuis autant d'années et ça n'a pas tant changé que ça. Et ça, ça me touche quand j'écoute ces remarques-là. Donc il y a un fond qui est là, qui reste très passionnel, beaucoup d'amour, mais très compliqué. La rupture a été violente. Euh, elle n'a pas été préparée. Et on, on, on ne se comprend pas. Et désormais, on a de deux mondes différents. Le mieux qu'on puisse faire, c'est de se reconnecter à travers de tels projets. Wow. Just to say that 
emotionally what's extremely painful is to feel, of course we're connected. You look at somebody in a movie and you say, that could be my sister. And at the same time, because the rupture was so violent and so extensive, we really deeply don't know each other. And so this sense that we could know each other and should know each other and that we really don't is extremely painful. And maybe Rokia is suggesting that there's even more lack of an understanding or knowledge from the African-American side about Africa. For one thing, because in Africa, America is always being presented. And very rarely is Africa presented in America. And so, so there's a, and this question of searching for roots and imagining, imagining Africa from here has its own very painful histories and consequences. Rokia is saying, you know, maybe what we can just try to do in our generation is begin to meet. And already this is huge. Et en ce qui concerne du fantasme de l'Afrique. And just to speak about the phantasms. That's not an English word. The, the, okay, good. C'est d'assumer le fantasme, de l'assumer et savoir qu'on est, qu est passionné et que tout ce qu'on croit n'est pas forcément possible, mais y croire quand même. Wow. Je, je, tu peux dire ça encore. Je ne veux pas le tricher, mais. OK, she's saying that. What you're saying is passionate and crazy. Absolutely, absolutely, sir. But it may not be true. <laughs> and believe. <laughs> and you believe it because it's fantastic and you are passionate about it. It just may not be true. Because when you look at what's going on in Kenya, au Mali. or in Mali, Le Mali est troisième producteur d'or d'Afrique. Uh, Mali is the second producer of gold the in third. Africa. Third producer of gold in Africa. Et l'un des pays les plus pauvres du monde. And one of the countries that is the poorest in the entire world. Au Congo Zaire. In Côte Congo Zaire. On devrait se dire, mais on n'y arrivera jamais. Je pense que je n'ai pas le droit. En Afrique, chaque fois que j'ai un cousin, une cousine, mon père, ma mère qui tombe malade. L'une des choses qui me désole, c'est que j'aimerais qu'ils aient les mêmes soins que nous avions quand nous étions à l'étranger avec mon père qui était diplomate. J'aimerais qu'ils puissent être tranquilles de la même, que ce soit, ce n'est pas un luxe de pouvoir faire une radio ou une analyse, de pouvoir se faire opérer. Tout ça est un luxe là-bas. Déjà, faire les analyses qu'il faut et savoir ce qu'on a. Et là, je me dis, même si moi, avec mon métier et mon statut, je vis différemment et je suis franco-malienne. J'ai toute une histoire des gens qui sont liés à moi qui font que je ne peux pas penser autrement que de me dire que ça peut changer. Parce que j'ai la même peine que si c'est moi qui tombe malade ou mon fils qui tombe malade. Et bien, lorsque je vois un neveu malade ou mon père ou quelqu'un d'autre autour de moi, j'ai exactement la même peine et une douleur incroyable de voir les gens mourir de maladies qui sont banales aujourd'hui dans les pays développés. Donc je sais que je suis folle, que je suis passionnée, que je suis beaucoup de choses. Peut-être on m'appelle des fois humaniste aussi et c'est péjoratif de nos jours. Je l'assume. Mais je pense, vu d'où je viens et mon histoire, je n'ai pas le choix si je veux euh, que les choses se passent autrement un jour. Je ne peux pas désespérer parce que sinon je ne pourrais plus monter sur scène. Je pense que je mourrais de tristesse d'une manière ou d'une autre. The pain is that when I have relatives, uh, aunts or uncles, uh, people in my extended family who are ill, I know that they can't get basic medical treatment that would be easily available here and that we get when we're on tour. But I know in Africa, people I love will die from something absolutely ridiculous that could be cured and treated very simply. But they simply have no access to care. And for me, this is one of the most painful parts of being alive, and it means I cannot go on and accept the situation. I need to make sure it changes in my lifetime. 
And at the same time, I cannot give up hope because then I have no business even stepping on a stage. So I have to remain committed to the process of change. And when I see people die pointlessly for no reason, it deeply, deeply moves me to continue my art and gives purpose to my life as a human being and as an artist. And people will think I'm crazy. People think that I'm, I'm fighting against something that's impossible, uh, uh, impossible odds. But in fact, there is no choice. There's absolutely no choice. It is unacceptable. And things must change. Great. <laughs> I'm sure Derek, I'm sure Derek Scott will love to follow that. <laughs> Tony has just vanished. Oh, T Tony vanished already. Hello, Tony. Hi. Oh, thanks. <laughs> we just don't see you. How dramatic. I'm not. But, I thought it was all set up that I'm. You're like one of those fantastic uh, uh, people in the play we just hear about but don't see. No, I'm here. But okay. I'm Intently, intently, to what okay. Rokia is saying and the, and the faculty members as well. Please continue. Thank you. Um, I guess I'll just first start by um, joining my fellow panelists. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? Closer? All right, good. Um, I want to thank my, uh, I want to thank Celeste and uh, the co-creators of this stunning work for inviting me to participate in this conversation. Um, and I do have a question, but I have to preface it first with a lot of stuff, so just kind of bear with me. Um, because the question I want to ask um, emerges out of a venture of a reading. I'm beginning to try to read a scene that arrested my attention in Desdemona, um, a scene that I think actually uh, does give us an opportunity to know more, as Toni Morrison said. Um, and that's the scene where uh, Desdemona reports that Othello's last confession to her was about um, his experience as a child soldier and his experience um, with Iago raping two old women in a stable uh, and being watched by a young boy. Um, so in thinking about this scene, um, I think first about how Shakespeare's Othello resonates in the present for me. Part of the way that it, it resonates is that it's a staging of a black man among people who seem to enjoy the privileges of inclusion or belonging because they're not black and who are rendered white by his blackness. Um, so it's a kind of staging of the spectacle of blackness, um, I think of uh, that play as being um, where a black man becomes an object of heightened attention. And then in addition to that, or adding a kind of layer to that level of spectacle, there's the uh, interracial erotics, the, the image of the interracial couple, the black-white interracial couple, um, which is signaled particularly by um, the famous line of Iago's, even now an old black ram is tupping your white you. Um, so that the play also resonates as a certain way of telling the story of and understanding black, white, and racial romance, and we focus on the image of black and white bodies um, as it's spoken of um, in, in Shakespeare's Othello. But we only get hints in Shakespeare's Othello um, of what Othello and Desdemona might actually think about or how they experience being a spectacle or being part of the spectacle. Um, and in Morrison's Desdemona, we actually have Othello saying that he regrets or he's unhappy about the way in which he allowed the spectacle of their union to take over um, and that part of the reason for his wanting to kill her uh, was to destroy the drama, to stop the drama, to, to somehow escape from the spectacle of, their, uh, of their, their being exemplars of difference and, 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 and of this kind of strange union. Um, as I think about it, the way that this confession works in Desdemona, what seems to me to be the case is that both Othello and Desdemona have a relationship, a very powerful investment, in fact, in spectacle. Um, but it's a spectacle that's not necessarily racially defined so much as it's gender defined, that they are very much invested in the image of the powerful male warrior, um, a powerful male warrior who's free from uh, 
any restraint who can embody violence without any vulnerability, who has unfettered rage. Um, and they seem, I think, to think of this image or to respond to this image as a kind of access to some better or idealized self for themselves, an idealized self that's powerful. Um, Desdemona, of course, in the play of Shakespeare's play, says that she sees and loves Othello's visage in his mind. And that, I think that line resonates, that gets used again in, in, Des, in Morrison's Desdemona. Um, but what becomes apparent in Morrison's Desdemona is that Desdemona believes she sees in Barbary first and then in Othello later, the quote is a, a glint of brass in the eye. Um, and then she's hearing these stories about how Barbary and Othello have uh, had these harrowing adventures and um, escaped slavery or been enslaved. And um, that seems to allow her to dream of other worlds, she says, but it seems primarily to dream of an other self for herself, um, that is an Amazon self that she names as Amazon particularly. Um, and that, that Amazon self, that sense of the, the brass that she sees in both Barbary and Othello and that she admires, these things get, I think, mixed together for her so that Africanness or proximity to or access to, connection to Africanness becomes access to these other worlds and other possibilities, access to warrior womanhood, uh, to Amazon strength, to the expression of a repressed brass in herself. And that to me seems like it's the underside of the, the claim she makes at the end of the play where she says she hates war. Um, I do think, even though she says that and that's uh, we take her at her word about that. It's also the case that she seems to have some sort of attraction to violence, some att attraction to having this Amazon strength. Even in the beginning of the play, she says that um, she's attracted to the violent colors of the afterlife, of the, of the sea uh, that, that she's looking at. Um, so I think she has that attraction to violence. And then Othello takes that attraction further um, in this confession that he's uh, giving to Desdemona, um, where he admits that what made him go along with Iago's manipulations um, of him um, was his desire to extend a feeling of brotherhood and camaraderie that he first experienced as a child soldier, um, the experience of camaraderie as being a soldier, as being a warrior with other men or with other males. Um, and when he was a child soldier, they were chewing these green leaves that apparently had this narcotic effect that allowed them to feel invulnerable, uh, allowed them to feel um, powerful, allowed them to rape and pillage and kill with a sense of impunity, with a sense of invulnerability. Um, and so that they're kind of embodying a, a sort of spectacular soldier um, that they, they can't be unless they, they, they chew these leaves. Um, and that becomes the first time that he's experiencing this, this, this sense of this camaraderie. Um, and it seems to me that what's kind of implied in his description of that, or, or Othello's description of this, this experience as a child soldier, is part of what works for him in it, um, or part of what creates the intimacy in it, is that he's doing these acts, this raping and killing, the rape is perfunctory, he says, um, along with others who are doing the same thing, and they're seeing each other do it, um, and they're seeing the other person doing it and being seen doing it themselves, in some ways magnifies them, it changes the man-child into a warrior, this act of witnessing um, what's happening. And then the, the, a phrase that sticks with me in his confession is that uh, the words are used, I believe, if I remember correctly, are, are the, wide, the wide, wild world of celebrity, uh, of, of, of the, the world of men, of men with each other, the wide, wild, world, uh, the wide, wild world of celebrity of men with each other. And celebrity is a, you know, a concept that already takes with it a spectator, there's a witness to uh, a celebrity. So what seems key to me in the confession, um, especially about the scene where Iago and Othello are raping the two old women uh, in the stable, um, is that there's the boy who's watching them do it. I mean, of course, there's the sense of uh, camaraderie that comes from uh, the sort of homosocial bond being pushed to the edges or overspilling into the homoerotic uh, while they're doing this together, and then we get some sort of signal about that with the, the phrase, the exchange of musk, that he says is more powerful than the, the, the renders romantic love uh, trivial by comparison. But the key thing is that the women who they rape only glance at them once, 
and never look at them again. Um, don't witness the event as it's being done to them. But the boy behind the heap of hay does watch them, um, and he looks at them with a wild-eyed look. Um, and the wild-eyed description of his look, to me, seems to resonate with the wild celebrity, sort of confirming the, the, the wildness of male celebrity. And then his looking at them ignites this look of complicity between the two of them. So there's all this kind of passing of looks, this sort of passing of witnessing um, between the three male characters in that recollection, in that confession. Um, and it seems to me then that his seeing them secures, that is the boy seeing Othello and Iago secures Othello's <coughs> fantasy of this kind of warrior idealization, this, this ideal notion of um, the kind of rapacious, uh, completely unfettered, uh, ultra-violent warrior. And then also this, this scene reminds me as, uh, of a scene from Toni Morrison's novel, The Boy's <coughs> Eye, the first novel, uh, is a kind of reversal of a scene that happens there where the character Charlie Breedlove, who ends up raping his daughter Piccola, um, the sort of formative experience in his young life is that he um, is out in the fields with uh, a girl, they're having sex, this is his first sexual experience, and then they're caught or discovered by uh, two white hunters who come upon them in the darkness, uh, shine a flashlight on them, force him to perform sexually um, as though he were a circus animal, and at that point it's uh, a kind of violation of him and her, and it's a sort of initiation into the codes um, of being a black male under white supremacy where you're both hypersexualized and completely subordinated <coughs> so that he's both violated and initiated at the same time. Um, and I think there's a kind of analogous result for this boy who's watching Othello and Iago in the scene uh, in the, the stable where he is initiated into a certain kind of uh, warrior manhood at the same time that he is um, subjected to it or suffers under it, I and mean, it's kind of presenting a model for him that he's going to have to live up to uh, or carry forward because the memory will never be gone. Um, even if he's going to take revenge, um, it's still a kind of model that he's being presented with. Um, so for me, that kind of raises the question um, of thinking about the relationship between the witness <coughs> and the warrior, or the witness um, who has to seem to be there for um, a fellow to feel a sense of, of, of the sense of camaraderie, that there's something that he, he wants to have, that it, it seems that he, he needs to have a witness, and Desdemona has, in her, in her own way, functioned as a witness for him in the past, in that she has seen his visage in his mind, um, and she's loved that, which is a kind of passionate desire for um, his own vision of himself. Um, so the question that I'd want to ask the creators of this piece um, is you know, what was your thinking about the relationship between witnessing and the warrior? Um, why is it, um, or is it the case, do you think, that um, the warrior, especially one that's, that's kind of living with this sense of, or that's experiencing this kind of unfettered sense of violence and, and rage, that warrior has to be seen, has to be witnessed by someone? Uh, why would that be? What's the relationship between those two things? Um, or another way of asking that question might be, um, why is it that Othello and Desdemona um, feel entranced by the image of this unfettered capacity for rage and violence that Othello represents? Well. Well, you know, I, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> oh, well, that's very, very interesting, your paper, your observations and your questions. Um, I do remember when uh, Peter Sellers did Othello um, before, you know, we had even really begun serious uh, development of Desdemona. And he said, you know, Othello was never alone on stage. He's always with somebody, coming or going, or they're looking at him, but he's never, ever alone. So your, your you know, acknowledgement of the place of spectacle, exoticism, uh, that Othello presents, 
uh, not just in the play, but as I have long noticed in the performances, uh, which I, none of which I've ever really liked, is not as a complicated human being, but as a kind of male, Africanist, black warrior slash symbol of something. I wanted to indicate the similar, I mean, how he came to be successful was precisely along those lines. As a young boy, you could get out of the cattle pen or the whatever by becoming a child soldier and feeling that you can direct all of your rage and all of your solitude in the traditional way. There is another Othello that he does not let anybody see except Desdemona. Uh, and she recognizes this other person who may or may not be the classic, powerful killing machine that he is understood to be by everybody else. <coughs> your, your observation about the witness is interesting to me because um, there's something, there's rape and then there's gang rape. And in the latter, certainly, the victim is not the point at all. It doesn't matter who it is. And it matters teenage gang rape, old people gang rape, whatever, military gang rape. Remember, that was part of the pay of soldiers in Rome, is pillage and rape. They didn't get any money. They stole and they raped. Um, but that group sense of sexual aggression has to do with the aggressors. It was very important to me that the woman or women that they attacked and assaulted were not young, were not beautiful, didn't have on short skirts. <clears throat> there were simply occasions for this exchange between these two men. And of course, the pornography of it is always the eye, excuse me, the witness. <coughs> Who makes it real? The memory has to go on. <coughs> Let me stop. <coughs> uh, can I just thank everybody for one oh, thing? Yeah. Just, just like really. Like, we have to keep talking a lot more because everybody brought up stuff that is in that piece. And thank you for bringing it forward. Because obviously, when you do something, there's lots and lots of layers. And in theater, it's two hours. And meanwhile, many lifetimes. And so there are many, many layers going on uh, that emerge differently from performance to performance. But you've all really nailed things. This question of the witness is one of the most important things about theater, because you're doing something for a witness. Yes. You're creating, you know, the Greeks had this idea of bringing in front of people something that's unspeakable, and creating these amphitheaters to do it, where every citizen had a seat to watch unspeakable things take place. And the Greeks really focused on tragedy, focused on horrible things, and said, we all have to watch this together as a way of creating a collective conscience and a sense that there is a civic conscience and a kind of moral sense that some kind of outrage is actually shared and holds us together as a community. So the other side of the witness in terms of the creation of a democratic, using the arts and the power of gathering of the arts as a place of a collective, first of all, the idea of a confession is you live with something alone that eats you. And first step of acknowledging yourself, what you've done is to have the courage to tell someone else. So nice. And that idea that you're not bearing something unbearable alone, but finally somebody is helping you to bear it is one of the deepest parts of a relationship and what it means to have friendship or deeper than that, to have a real partner and someone who can recognize parts of you that you don't like or don't want to live with further. So to me, the other side of what you're saying, which is so beautiful, 
the other side of that is what it means for him to confess those things to her. And, and the attempt exactly in his, what you describe so spectacularly, his appalling solitude as an object in a permanent display case is to finally have someone he could talk to and not talk to as one of the guys because the guy talk all led in a certain direction and had its motor, its motor was violence. And I think it's also Shakespeare's point is that this guy who never had a chance to be anything else, Desdemona did see he could be someone else and he saw that when she looked at him. And as soon as he's away from her and back in Iago's sphere again, he can't find that person that she found in him. And Tony has a beautiful line with, you know, the Othello, the man I knew was lost to me, so what was the point of fighting? And I think Shakespeare's powerful image is that she doesn't fight back when he's strangling her. You know, she, which is an incredible image. You know, and on one side, it's Shakespeare's Jesus in the form of a woman letting someone take his life, take her life, and not complaining and not fighting and not giving back to that person what they're giving to you. And at the same time, this, um, this idea that the act, even in Shakespeare, isn't finished. One of the most astonishing things actually staging the murder scene is that you don't know when Desdemona dies. And that is a very powerful thing. Shakespeare keeps her alive for pages. Even though he's finished with her, she's alive. Now when you strangle someone, they're dead. Four pages later, she's still saying things. So Shakespeare is suggesting, I think, something else you know, which is very powerful, and opening them into an eternal space, a space that doesn't have certain limits, time-space limits. And, and, and I do think that's part of Shakespeare's project, which is the other thing that I think inspired the idea in Tony's work, that the story isn't over, that there's some continuation of the story that needs to happen, because Shakespeare doesn't end it either. It ends in such a strange way. It doesn't end. Nonetheless, um, also the gaze question in Shakespeare is, as you said, it's also fetishized with the handkerchief. Mm -hmm. And all of these pornographic signals, Shakespeare, you know, the, the story of the handkerchief in Shakespeare's Othello is so disgusting because who bought it for whom? It's passed through everybody's hands. And it becomes this fetishized, sexualized, bizarre, pornographic sign that at one point, literally, Cassio is asking his girlfriend to make him a copy of it. Like, super like pornography. Like, I want one for myself at home so I can do what? Like, what? You know, it's, it's Shakespeare takes this fetishization thing so far in the play. And I think, again, what you identify beautifully as this pornographic image of this black man as a display item with unlimited, quote unquote, powers, and that also the sexuality is violent in its nature, you know, is really incredible. And I think Tony's offered, you know, him and Desdemona another set of possibilities. And I think one of the big challenges working on this, I think one of the things Tony and I discussed a lot was could we see Othello and Desdemona in love? Because in Shakespeare, their love is threatened already in the very first scene of the play. And you don't get to see them enjoy each other, ever. You know, they have like 10 lines where you get to see they're having a good time. But most everything else, they're under enormous pressure. They're having to speak to each other in code because other people are next to them. They're having to, you know, which one of the tensions of the play she doesn't always understand. So she's busy saying things to him inappropriately in front of other people because she doesn't have a problem, but in a military hierarchy, you can't just go up to somebody and start talking about that stuff. 
and Desdemona doesn't get that all the time. And Shakespeare shows you what's appropriate, inappropriate to share about an intimate relationship in a public situation. Uh, so one of Tony's projects was to show Desdemona and Othello actually in love before their relationship became insanely pressured by witnesses. And I think one of the most powerful images in Shakespeare, and you identified exactly, since their lives are a spectacle, and her dad's a senator, and all of this is happening live on CNN, is they elope. They don't have a proper marriage. They go to some motel and don't tell anybody, and his chief of staff can't find him. And the play opens with everybody saying, where are they? Because nobody even knows they're so to have some moment of a real relationship, they have to run and hide and go to some place where there are no witnesses. And then immediately, somebody you know, calls in the telephone number of that motel and the place is surrounded by cameras and Shakespeare's play begins with the cameras moving in on Othello and Desdemona in bed on their wedding night. You know, and the senator calling for, you know, whoever kidnapped his daughter to be brought to justice on live television. You know, so it's, it's a, your sense of what's public and the way the public world and the world of witnesses pressurizes their relationship and puts each of them in, in extremely strained artificial situations is really powerful, you know. Tony, hello, welcome back. Oh, we're Thank glad you you're feeling much. better. Sorry about all that. I didn't drop dead, I went close though. <laughs> Well, that would have been the third time, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I do want to allow... It's a part of the conversation. I really am intently interested in the questions that were put and Peter's answers and also this notion of uh, what was that relationship between Iaco and Othello? What was going on there? And so you're thinking, you know, not just the obvious things, but what connected them? must have been a secret, something they shared, something they both understood. It would have been unspeakable, except finally he is able to speak it in that circumstance of posthumous life. Uh, Celeste wants to open this to the audience, Tony. Oh, all right. So who wants to take advantage of this unbelievable opportunity to ask one of the artists a question? Um, if you want, stand up and talk loud, okay? Or uh, should I hand a mic over? Okay. Maybe Celeste, do you want to? Or okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Thank you, um, Rokia. My question is specifically addressed to you. Um, I've been listening to your music for over 15 years, and you introduced me to the world of Malian music. Um, so much so that now I have a library of over 450 CDs from Mali. Um, many of your lyrics during your four, over your, the course of your four CDs are about death and relationships. Um, I know I've tried to do my own rudimentary translations from Bambara. Um, and your music helped me weep after uh, a girlfriend died and moved so deeply uh, within the life, love, and death, the thick love, as uh, Abdul talked about. And it would mean so much to me if you could help, if you could discuss your personal, your cultural relationship with death um, one, over the course of your music, over the last 15 years, and two, in your work with, um, with Toni Morrison on this play. And that's what I really wanted to ask you the other night when I ran into you getting Chinese food, but it wasn't the right time. <laughs> <laughs> Je suis très heureuse d'avoir en quelque sorte, vous avoir présenté la musique malienne et vous amener à écouter d'autres artistes maliens. Merci. I'm very grateful that you have spoken of and presented Malian music and spoken also of uh, 
the need to listen to other artists, other Malian artists. I'm very proud. Thank you. Et du coup, j'ai l'impression qu'avec Tony, on est de sorte d'hôtesse de la mort. Yes, I, I, I think uh, Tony and I are now the hostesses to the world of death. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the gatekeepers, please welcome to the world of death. <laughs> en fait, dans ma culture, on est censé accepter uh, la mort parce que c'est en venant dans ce monde, c'est en quelque sorte on, on signe un engagement, c'est d'en repartir. Uh, in my culture, we are really taught to uh, engage with death because it really is uh, a part of life. And it's a. Um, on est, on arrive en sachant que on va partir, repartir. Oh, because uh, it's a place of departure and return. Et on le dit très souvent uh, ici, nous ne sommes né qu'un endroit de de d'échange, de discussion. Ce n'est qu'un endroit de fête. La vie, c'est ça, parce que c'est une expérience unique. Et unique euh, dans ce sens où on ne sait même pas ce qui va arriver derrière. In this life, we're here as a place, this place where we are is a place of discussion and exchange, more than a place of facts. And celebration. And it is also, we're here to celebrate. And this is a, a place, yeah, a place of celebration. Yeah. Et euh, n'empêche que j'ai du mal. Personnellement, c est, c est, ma culture est faite comme ça, mais euh, moi, j'ai l'impression plutôt d'une trahison. C'est-à-dire que euh, cet engagement dans ma culture, tout le temps, tous les jours, euh, il y a une, une organisation sociale qui est là pour nous le rappeler d'une manière ou d'une autre. Mais euh, c'est très difficile à se rappeler. Je pense qu'on arrive à accepter aussi cette vie, on arrive à l'apprécier lorsqu'on oublie qu'on peut la quitter ainsi que tout ce qu'on voit partir. C'est-à-dire que c'est très rare de se rendre compte quand quelqu'un meurt que ce aurait pu être nous. So there's a complicated uh, when you see somebody leave this world it's difficult to remember your next that could be you. And at the same time, we are here to celebrate, and therefore, your sadness or your, uh, your difficulty with life is not the most important thing. And it's very difficult to remember that and to deal with that and to deal with the fact that there's something larger that we're here to face. Et comme en Afrique, plus qu'ailleurs, je crois. And because in Africa, more than elsewhere, I think. On vit avec la mort. We live with death. Je suis entre les deux, entre l'Occident et le, le Mali, l'Afrique, depuis l'âge de trois ans. I am between the West and Africa and Mali since I was three years old. J'ai des amis des deux côtés. I have friends in both places. Et sans faire de statistiques, ni rien du tout. And without getting into statistics. Il se trouve que je n'ai jamais perdu aucune amie euh, européenne. I have never lost a friend, a European friend. Le, au cours d'un accouchement. From giving birth. And ah, now I'm translating your English. Sorry about that. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Pierre. Merci, merci. You, you know, I'm relaxed because <laughs> I know I don't have to think of my words and anything. So you are so, it's amazing. Thank you for no. translating. <laughs> Et du côté malien, quand, rien que celle auquel je pense là, il y en a six. From, if I just think of Mali, I know six women who lost their lives giving que birth. Que je connais, qui ont partagé ma vie avec lesquelles And they were part of my proche. life. Et du coup, je n'arrive pas à oublier, je n'arrive pas à I, accepter. And in fact, I just can't forget that, and I can't forget any of them, and I can't find a way to forget any of them. Parce que si nous finissons tous par mourir, ce qui est sûr, il est clair que ça arrive plus rapidement en Afrique que dans les pays développés. 
And it's just very clear that this happens much more in Africa than it would happen in a developed country. Et je, je pense que le fait que je chante souvent la mort est lié à ça. C'est que je vis And avec ça et j'ai du mal à accepter. The fact that I sing about death just comes because I'm living with it and I'm surrounded by it and so it becomes part of my music. Et j'ai du mal à accepter. Je me dis c'est pas normal. And I will not accept it. I cannot accept it. And that's one of the reasons to sing. Pretty soon we're going to have to take a break. So any other brave soul? Oh dear. Um, this woman over here. Great. Maybe you can pass the mic back. <laughs> Don't steal it. Then I will use Rokia's mic. Of course. Yes. And then this one will. Okay. So that mic can stay there yeah. and I will share. Thank you. Um, I was very uh, struck by so many points in the discussion and in, in the uh, work itself, but I wanted to highlight um, one aspect. I think, uh, Tamara, you said that the microphone um, was, was in itself its own element in the work, and it at times enhanced or gave um, a space for nuance in voice. Um, and at other times also created a disconnect or a disembodiment from voice and the person speaking. So going to the body uh, in this work, I, was, I wanted to ask Rokia and, and everyone really about movement in the piece. Um, like everything else, uh, it was very stripped down. And like everything else, it was highly amplified. Um, and the, It was uh, amazing to see your movement in your body, often done in the silent sections, but also the other women who were in concert with their own rhythm and sound. And each one was very unique and personal in their movement language. And I wondered how, how that component Uh, resonated for you. Il y a il, il y a un lien certain entre ce qu'on pense et ce qu'on est. There's a connection between what you think and what you are. Ce que les autres pensent et la manière dont on y réagit. What other people think and how other people react. Mais on n'en est pas forcément conscient. But you're not always aware of this. De faire de la musique, spécialement chanter, je pense que c'est valable aussi pour les instruments. Mais le chant est, est un instrument très difficile parce que c'est un instrument qui est en nous. Singing is different from instruments. Maybe some of this applies to instruments, but frankly, singing is something in us, in our body. Et on ne peut pas maîtriser cet instrument sans se connaître et sans connaître son corps. Uh, on, quand on donne des cours de chant, on a l'impression l'élève ne se rend pas compte, mais c'est comme si on rentre dans sa vie parce que pour comprendre son problème là où ça bloque, il faut comprendre la personnalité, la manière dont la personne aborde le chant, etc. C'est extrêmement compliqué et ça fait plus on avance, plus on comprend au bout de 15 ans. Comme monsieur disait, ça fait l'air de rien, 15 ans que je chante en tant que professionnel et que j'aime ça. Donc pour avancer, il faut comprendre cette relation. Sa relation à son corps, euh, les autres par rapport à soi-même, ce qu'on comprend qui se traduit par notre corps, et arriver à maîtriser ça. Sinon, on ne peut pas atteindre une certaine limpidité qu'on a envie d'atteindre dans le chant. Giving singing courses, one of the most important things working with students is working through their personal issues and their personal problems because those things block the voice there and you carry them in your body. And so uh, living in your body becomes a, a question, singing becomes a question of living in your body, the way you live in your body and how people see you living in your body, which sometimes becomes consciously or unconsciously part of the performance. But the most important thing is that it's a project of your entire body when you sing. And your life history. 
And so a singing class, again, gets into very, very personal questions because you're trying to unblock all of those channels. Et au fur et à mesure, moi, je l'analyse parce que c'est mon métier. Et je pense que beaucoup de gens ne s'en rendent pas compte. Mais au fur et à mesure, on, on apprend à vivre avec son corps et on, on apprend à comprendre cet impact que les autres ont sur nous, sur scène et aussi dans la vie de tous les jours. Et quelque part, je pense même que ça aide à comprendre les autres puisque quand on sait comment on est dans son corps, on imagine comment les autres sont on arrive aussi à analyser leurs réactions. Et tout cela par rapport à la musique, quand on est sur scène, ou à ce que dit l'autre, ou au rire, quand on veut jouer de ça, il y a tellement de choses à mettre en interaction avec son corps. If you really understand how you are in your body, then you also begin to understand how people see that. And it becomes an insight into other people watching them look at you and seeing what they are seeing or what they're not seeing. But you really have to first be aware and living deeply in your own body and understanding your center. And you have to be living in your center. And once you are centered, then you begin to understand what the gaze of people around you is bringing into your life. And you can begin to treat that critically. And as an artist, be aware of it and use it from the stage. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and you are it. Uh, thanks. Just really quickly, I had a question. Um, when I was watching the play, um, throughout, there's, it clearly has a lot to do with women. Um, and there was, a, you know, throughout, um, most of the men, or well, I, as I remember, there's only two men, male voices, which are Othello and Cassio. And um, Othello is always spoken through um, the actress, and then Cassio is kind of given this, you know, presentation as very s strange and, and other, which I, I mean, I, I didn't know at first that I guess that's because he's still alive, um, but <laughs> still, it's you know, it's it's strange that he would be able to speak for himself, whereas. Othello is kind of mediated through the voice of the actress. And um, I was wondering, it was strange that that would happen while at the same time there were male uh, instrumental accompanists on stage. Um, so that there was this situation where there was still kind of a very strong expressive foundation created by men um, and not women. And I was wondering uh, why you decided to still have the men on stage, kind of with this very distinct, expressive voice, uh, despite kind of the dominance of women throughout the play. Tony, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, yeah, I can say a little bit about it. Um, during the script, I was not aware of the combination that might surface among the musicians. I knew Rokia, <clears throat> and I had seen her with women singing behind her at events in New York. I had no idea of what else would be there. So that was not uppermost in my mind. It was a place for the erased, silenced voices of women, primarily to talk to each other, uh, primi primarily to understand what was going on with them whether there were race differences or class differences or just misunderstandings, et cetera, sexual innuendo and so on. But the point of Desdemona's life and death is Othello. So she represents his voice, both the way he understands himself and the way she understands him, so that she takes the place that he had and that the men all had in the original play. Uh, the women don't get to say anything except woe is me <clears throat> or a lack and alas he's murdered her, <laughs> etc. So filling in all of that was the whole point. And so it is, it's not lopsided, it's just straightened out 
the population of the Shakespearean drama. And I think an actress can do a number of things with Othello's voice. This actress is doing all the voices, which is phenomenal in my mind, absolutely phenomenal. And whether she chooses to accent Othello's voice or merge it with her own or drop it an octave or whatever, just to distinguish it uh, from her own voice, if it's not you know, sort of clear on the stage, is really a personal and a directorial decision. Uh, and it can be done a number of ways. I mean, if this were a book, you know, printed, it would have her name, his name, et cetera. And you wouldn't need the inflections, the sounds, and so on to know that this was Othello speaking. But what was interesting to me, and this is just something that happened with the help of the actresses uh, that, that performed, is that I had written the ending of Desdemona as a kind of counterpoint. He says this, she says that, he says that, until they end up, or she ends up saying that final thing, we shall be judged by how well we have loved. But that was a dialogue. And it turns out that in the actual performance, it's not. She says that. Desdemona merges those voices. And I think it's far more interesting the way it's being done now than it was the original way in which I thought it up. You don't have to have Othello saying one thing in one accented voice and her saying another. Now it's all of them in this really sacred, it seems to me, and joyful ending uh, in which her voice, which is an echo, of his now that they've come to some understanding about what they meant to it. Uh, Rokia, would you say a word about the men in your band, or we don't need to say another word? Merci, Tony. Tony has done it. Great. <laughs> Merci, Tony. You did it. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. We should take a little break. We should take a break so some of you who have to go may, but don't forget, Rokia will still perform for us. We'll just so. do a little moment uh, to just talk about the Malian music as well in this context. Okay. Uh, that would be great. We'll so we'll just to have a moment to readjust the stage and get some air. Uh, one of the things that really interested me was what would the story of Othello sound like if it had been sung during Shakespeare's lifetime in Africa? And because Rokia has studied with some of the traditional griots, she's not herself part of the griot tradition, but understands it and in a certain way as a contemporary artist can reinvent it. Um, Rokia proposed the song of Keme Borama that we put in the, in the show of Desdemona, in the period, in the passage where Tony invents the stories that Othello told. Then Rokia responds in the performance with a traditional African epic, the Mande, epic of the Mandan kingdom. And, uh, and Toni Morrison told us, that's a special project, should be done in another show, not Desdemona. <laughs> <laughs> Please go ahead and recover the traditional Mandan epic, but not now. <laughs> And yet, it's just a thrilling moment, and Rokia has been really generous and says that she will perform this now for you with all of the beautiful artists. Bintu Sumbulu, Fatim Kuyate, Adiatu Sangare, Mama Javate, Mama Diba Kamara. Thank you, Peter.
you very much. Merci beaucoup. as a way to end this amazing afternoon, would you tell us what you say? <laughs> C'est une chanson qui parle de l'épopée de Kemé Bélama. It is the, uh, it's, a, it's a song that sings of the epic of Kemé Bélama. Ce qui est l'un des dernières que, qui, qui a existé en fait, parce que c'était juste avant la pénétration de, de, du colon français dans le Kénédougou. So this comes from a period in the 19th century, just before the really deep penetration of the French colonialists into central Mali. Donc je crois que d'après les informations que j'ai eues par différents griots, c'était l'une des dernières fois qu'on chantait euh, les, les louanges ou l'histoire d'un guerrier de la sorte. So this was, this, the warrior Kemi Baramo was one of the last times that they sang the epic of a warrior going into battle. This is just the before French contact went you know, deeply in to erase that culture. Et quand on recoupe ce que les griots disent et ce qui a été écrit par euh, ce que le, le, le colon français a écrit par rapport à l'histoire, euh, on comprend qu'en fait Kemé Birama s'est donné la mort plutôt par rapport euh, euh, à une nouvelle situation qui arrivait qui était la, la, la pénétration française. Parce que d'après ce que j'ai lu, il avait déjà envoyé son fils euh, en France au sein de l'armée française, etc. Oh my God. Uh, according to uh, you know, some of the research she's done and some of the histories, even some of the histories written by the French, Kemi Borama was the last of a certain breed of warrior. And he knew that that age of the warfare was over with, with the French presence. And he had already sent his son ahead to France to join the French army. Et lorsque son fils est revenu, and his son came back, il, uh, il lui a fait un compte rendu en lui exprimant son scepticisme par rapport à la possibilité de vaincre l'armée française. And his son came back with extreme skepticism about the possibility of being able to win against the French army. Et il était, uh, il lui a demandé de garder le silence sur ses sentiments. And uh, Kemi Brahma asked his son to remain silent about his feeling on this. Ce qu'il n'a pas fait, lui, pas dit que. His son didn't do. Il en a parlé à d'autres euh, soldats, guerriers de leur so armée. So he spoke, but his son didn't do that. He spoke of his feelings to other warriors and soldiers. Et comme il était un homme très sévère et très juste, qu'il punissait de manière très cruelle aussi les soldats qui avait peur et qui ne se battait pas correctement. So because Kemal Barama was a man of intense uh, sense of justice and, uh, and severity, in fact, uh, a kind of warrior culture which punished very severely each uh, breach of proper protocol. Il y a un tas d'histoires qui accompagnent ce que j'ai chanté qui ne sont pas dans ce récit-là, épique, mais ce que Kemal Barama a fait pour punir son fils euh, face à... Euh, 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 aux soldats qui commençaient à déserter, c'est qu'il l'a enterré à moitié dans un trou, enfin à moitié jusqu'à la tête, dans un trou d'où il ne pouvait pas sortir et l'a laissé abandonner dans le désert. En interdisant, enfin c'était même pas dans le désert, c'était pas loin de leur, du camp de, de, oui. de, duquel il se battait, en signifiant à sa mère que si elle s'approchait, elle subirait le même sort. So Kemi Varama punished his son for speaking to other soldiers and causing them to desert by burying him alive halfway within view of the camp in the desert. And, uh, and he died that way. And Kemi Varama said to his mothers, if they approached him, they would have the same death. 
Et ça, ce sont des récits que les griots m'ont appris. Et dans les récits écrits par le colon français, ils disent que ce fils est le fils de Samori Touré, pour le, qui était le frère de Kémé Bourama, pour lequel il se battait. OK. So, uh, and uh, this comes from, from stories told by griots, and also the French narratives are that this son was maybe actually the son of not Kémé Bourama, but his brother, who was his older brother, who was the person who charged Kemi Barama with going out into battle. Ouais. Et du coup, on fait le lien, on se rend compte de, de la, que l'histoire a existé, et comme c'est le plus proche des épopées, la plus proche de, de notre période, on se rend compte aussi de la véracité de ce qui est raconté dans d'autres épopées, comme, et puis un mélange avec la légende, comme l'épopée Mandingue. So, uh, what interests uh, Rokia in this is it's the It's the epic story that is the most recent. It's of the most recent warrior. And at the same time, because we can check some of the facts and some of the historical dimensions of it, it makes us then look back at older epics with more uh, informed uh, regard. Et euh, au final, ce qui s'est passé, c'est que Samori Touré, donc, qui était le seigneur et qui était en train, en fait, sera probablement devenu le prochain empereur du monde s'il n'y avait pas eu la colonisation française, puisqu'il avait déjà euh, euh, conquis une grande partie avec l'aide des Anglais qui colonisaient la Sierra Leone et qui lui amenaient des armes contre des esclaves ou euh, de l'or. Wow. So, the story is that uh, his brother, Samé, Samori Touré. Sa, sa, Samori. Samori. His brother Samori Touré would have probably been the next emperor of, of the Mandan region because he was already engaged with the English in Sierra Leone who were bringing arms in exchange for slaves. And so... Uh, and Bromo's, gold. And gold. And so uh, Kemi Brahma's own brother was uh, involved already with the colonialist forces. And... Um, ce, ce qui s'est passé, c'est que cette bataille, l'histoire parle d'une bataille précise. So the, all of this, what she sang is around one very specific battle. Qui est la bataille euh, du Kenedugu. Que Samori Touré, c'est là qu'il qu s'est fait arrêter. Il n'est pas parti plus loin. C'est à la frontière entre le Mali et la Côte d'Ivoire. Une ville très exactement qui s'appelle Sikasso et qui existe encore. Right, the, 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 the town of Sikasso, which is on the border between Mali and Ivory Coast, and it still is an important city. This was the place at which Samori Touré's uh, army had to stop. Et euh, lorsque Samori Touré n'arrivait pas à en pénétrer la ville de Sikasso qui était entourée par un mur qu'on appelait le Tata. So this uh, the the city of Sikasso is surrounded by a, a wall was, was surrounded by a wall called Tata which was impenetrable and it meant that the army outside besieging it couldn't get through this wall. Et il s'est énervé, je pense qu'il n'a pas réussi à pénétrer aussi parce que son armée était affaiblie, parce que les soldats commençaient à déserter, parce que il était mis à mal par le colonisateur français qui arrivait. So the soldiers were weakened, they were hungry, some of the soldiers had already been deserted, so they really just couldn't penetrate this wall. Il a appelé son frère et l'a blâmé. Il lui a dit que c'est parce qu'il avait peur qu'ils n'arrivaient pas à emporter la bataille du Kenedou. Samori then called his brother, Kemi Barama, his younger brother, and blamed him for this uh, impasse, for this kind of defeat, and said it's because you have no courage. Et sa réaction à ce que son frère a dit a été... Euh, de se, se suicider en gros en fonçant sur le tata mais il a mis tout ça en scène c'est à dire qu'il n'a pas je pense qu'il était désespéré il savait que ça ne marchera de toute façon pas puisque l'armée française a avancé en même temps et il y avait des alliances avec des royaumes à gauche à droite en fait l'Afrique tombait et donc il a dit à son frère entendu j'ai compris et à cette époque là il y avait un grand respect pour l'aîné il ne l'a pas contredit et lui a dit je m'en vais aujourd'hui et ce que je te promets, c'est que ce que je vais faire pendant longtemps, on en parlera après toi, Samori Touré, et après moi, euh, euh, Kemé Bourama, notre mort. On continuera à parler de cette histoire. Et elle, elle ne sera pas médiocre. Regarde-moi, attends de voir ce que je vais faire. Je ne te décevrai pas. Kemé Bourama, knowing that the cause was basically hopeless, that Africa was falling that this was Africa's last stand. And meanwhile, his brother was, encouraging him, uh, uh, was accusing him of cowardice. Kemi Burma's answer back to his brother was, okay, watch what I will now do. 
in the future they will sing and speak about me and you will be forgotten. Means veut dire la bataille a atteint son comble. Ton courage a dépassé dépasse les bornes. Oh my God! So the, the, that phrase means that uh, your courage is actually uh, has is beyond fulfilled. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's. Et parce qu'il est arrivé après avoir eu l'entrevue avec son frère, il est venu voir les griots. Il leur a demandé, puisque dans une cour, il y a un royaume qui va en bataille, ils assiègent, et pendant qu'ils assiègent, c'est comme dans les épopées euh, de n'importe quelle histoire, pendant qu'ils assiègent, il y a toute une ville qui se construit en face de la ville qu'ils essaient de conquérir. Donc il y a leur griot qui les accompagne pour euh, euh, rajouter à l'histoire tous les faits de la bataille. Et il allait voir ces griots-là, il a dit donc, euh, venez, c'est là, on va, aujourd'hui, on va faire une célébration. Ils se sont étonnés, ils lui ont dit, mais on n'a rien emporté. Ça fait plus de trois mois qu'on est devant le tata, on n'emporte pas la bataille, qu'est-ce que tu veux qu'on célèbre Et il leur a dit, mais prenez vos balafons, prenez votre, vos tamas, vos cora et vos goni, venez célébrer, venez me célébrer et dites devant moi, ce que vous direz une fois que je serai parti à jamais. So he was in front of this this wall that nobody could get through. The, the, his small army that was besieging the city of Sissoko. Um, of course, a besieging army has a small village connected to it. That is that they bring with them. That's cooking. That's creating everything. Also, of course, they're griots. They're musicians. So he goes to the musicians and says, "Okay." We're, we're going to embark on this last battle, this last campaign. Now I want all you musicians to get out your instruments and sing of my greatness before I leave. And sing about me the way you will sing after my death and into the future. Et, euh, ne oh, pas. And they said, what's to celebrate? We haven't won anything. We've been here, sitting here three months. We're starving. This is not working. People are deserting. It's a disaster. Why should we be celebrating? Et voilà. Et il a dit, mais moi, parce que je veux entendre ce que vous direz une fois que je serai plus là. So I, and he said, no, I want you now to sing, what, I want to hear while I'm alive what you will sing after I'm gone. Et ainsi le refrain, ah, il est, quel avara, avara, exista, eh bien, alors, ça, ça attend son comble. So the other meaning of that phrase is, okay, we're waiting to see. Et il a demandé à ses femmes de porter la robe de veuve. And he asked all of his wives to dress as widows. Et ne comprenant pas, elles non plus, elles l'ont porté. Elles and they dit. didn't understand, and so they came in their blue robes uh, as widows. Et lui ont dit, alors maintenant, qu'est-ce qui se passe Il leur a dit, gardez cette robe, le bleu de la veuve vous va très bien. And he's surrounded by his wives, all dressed as widows, and he says, keep these robes on, the blue looks very good on you. Et lorsqu'ils ont fait, ils lui ont chanté toute la nuit, And they sang all night. Dans cette chanson qui a été créée pour lui à son honneur. And this song, which was made in his honor. Au petit matin, il a pris son fusil. Early, early in the morning, he took his gun. Et son cheval. And his horse. Et il a foncé sur le tata. And he started going directly towards the wall. Ce qui n'était pas possible parce qu'à l'époque tout le monde savait que l'artillerie ou les archers de tata étaient très adroits. So that was a, a impossible because everybody knew that in the wall uh, you know uh, uh, were the artillery and the sharpshooters who anybody approaching the wall would be shot down et ils étaient étonnés en le voyant arriver mais lui alors il ne manque pas de courage d'après ce que les griots disent ils ont discuté et plaisanté entre eux alors qu'est-ce qu'on fait on parie je le touche à la poitrine je le touche à la tête so the sharpshooters looking at him walking towards them in fact there was this light headed conversation, I mean very lightweight conversation saying, well, okay, here's this crazy person coming towards us. The one thing we can say is he doesn't lack courage. Uh, I'll shoot him in the heart, you shoot him in the head. Et ils ont parié, ils ont tiré, évidemment ne l'ont pas manqué. And they shot him and they did not miss. Alors, à l'époque, le roi du Kenedou qui était Cheba, Traoré. The king uh, who was inside the wall 
Cheba Traoré a demandé à ses gardes de faire entrer le corps. Oh, may I tell one little part of the story? Mm -hmm. There's one little part which is, so he's riding his horse towards the wall and the sharpshooters shoot him in the heart and he keeps coming. Which is so a very powerful moment. And they can't kill him by shooting his heart. And then finally, the other set of sharpshooters targets his head, and he falls. Et en fait, il a atteint un niveau que personne n'avait jamais atteint de toute façon. And so he, and that's spoken of as a level of courage that nobody ever reached. And so the king inside the wall said, uh, "We will open the gates of the city, and we'll bring his body in and bury it with honor." Et ce qui fait que malgré que c'est ils aient été ennemis, euh, aujourd'hui encore, le corps de Kémé Bélama repose parmi les soldats euh, de valeur de l'armée ennemie. Et donc, même à ce jour, il est connu que le cœur de Kémé Bélama est enterré et est honoré dans le cimetière des plus grands soldats de l'ennemi. Et euh, par contre, ce que m'a raconté un griot, c'était que la famille de Kamehameha a pris ça pour un déshonneur et qu'ils disent qu'ils ont récupéré le corps, que le corps repose dans le mandé. But meanwhile, Kamehameha's family took that as a dishonor and they vowed they will go and retrieve the body. Alors, ils disent qu'ils l'ont fait. Aujourd'hui, they claim they did that. Donc, il a deux tombes. So there are two, two stories. Et aujourd'hui encore, c'est la question au Mali. C'est que personne n'est allé fouiller dans les tombes. Les Malinkés soutiennent que Kemeburama repose au Mandé. So the Malinkés claim that his uh, that his body is still in the Mandé. Et les Senfo disent qu'il repose parmi leurs guerriers de valeur dans le Kenedou. And the Senfo say no, his body is with their warriors in the Kenedou. Et le griot qui m'a parlé m'a dit mon grand père était là. Il m'a affirmé que il a vu son arrière grand père que le corps n'est jamais sorti du tata et que oh c'est un God. mensonge. And the griot who taught her this said my great grandfather was there and he said that heart never came past the tata. He told that to my father who told me and, and I so, will tell to my son. <laughs> <laughs> this is Rokia Traoré everyone. Uh, Uh, you, you've got a taste of the Mandan epic that is also this tradition of telling the story of warriors and telling it with all these complex nuances, all of these uh, uh, interesting questions that move across these histories and a way in which all of these complex histories get interwoven as a poetic thread but also as a song, as you can hear, When we first proposed Kemi Barama, all, all the musicians got really excited yeah. because it's the music, you can feel the music. The music speaks of this incredible courage and centuries later, you, you, you just weep involuntarily in this beautiful song. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, may we thank the Townsend Center. May we thank uh, Rokia. May we thank Tony. Tony, thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you, Cal Performances. Thank you, crew here at Cal Performances. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Joey.